Hello and welcome to Ask Your Academic. Today's session will cover the MSc, MSc Human Nutrition and we're joined by our programme lead and um, a member of our administration team. Um, <clears throat> we have a number of questions that have been submitted beforehand, so we'll do our best to get through all of those. If during the session you have any further questions, you can use the chat box um, and we'll keep an eye on that. You can also use that to say hello and let us know where you're watching from. If after today's session you have any further questions, you can email the administration team uh, and you'll find those details on the web page of the programme on our website near the top in the blue box. And if you've got any sort of specific questions about funding or your application, I'll put some useful links into the chat box for you to follow up with those. Um, and we are recording today's session, so that will be made available to you afterwards. Um, so we don't have a lot of time, so I think we maximise uh, the time we've got with um, our panel here. Um, so if you could both introduce yourself, um, and Alison, if you could give an, an overview of the programme, that would be amazing. Okay. Annie, do you want to introduce yourself first and then? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Annie. Uh, I'm the administrator for the MSc Human Nutrition Programme. So I help out with all things enrolment, registration, Moodle, submissions, any kind of queries on the administrative site. Thanks, Annie. Um, my name is Alison Parra. I'm the programme lead for Human Nutrition. Um, and I'll give you a brief overview about the programme. So the MSc Human Nutrition has been running for a number of years. We have a highly mixed bag of students between 35 and 55 students every year, international, EU and home students. Um, it's 12 months full time. We don't run it as part time or distance learning. It is very intense. I'm going to tell you that up front. It's quite um, a lot to do within the 12 months. So you have nine months of taught course, which is spread over core um, teaching and then a specialization module. And then you have a three month research project if you meet the requirements. Um, so the core courses are food and nutrients and nutrition through the life si cycle, um, dietary and nutritional assessment, public health and eating behavior, digestion, absorption and metabolism, and we are introducing a new course this year, which is called Research Skills. So you may have seen on the website that it says Research Proposal. That course is being withdrawn and it probably will be Research Skills. So just to make you aware of that. Our four specialisations are Obesity and Weight Management, Clinical Nutrition, Public Health Nutrition and Sports and Exercise Nutrition. We are an accredited course. Um, so that means that there are competences that you have to meet through the programme in the various courses as you go along. And if by the time we look at um, after all the teaching, you haven't met those competences, you may be then put onto a different programme, which is called human nutrition with knowledge transfer. Um, but if you've got any specific questions about that, I can answer them. Thank you. Um, and actually, I was just about to ask a question that's come through in the chat box there, and it's more about the specialism. So when do you choose the specialism for the programme? OK, so some people already know what they want to do when they come to us, and some people have no idea and are interested in all aspects of nutrition and don't really know what the difference is between the specialisations. So around late October time, we have some talks with the specialization leads so they will give you an overview of what their specialization is like um will they'll give you an overview of what their coursework is what their assessment is um what types of things they cover and then you will be asked to make a decision by early november so there's a lot of interaction with specialization leads with myself so that you have an informed choice if you're really not sure what you want to do at the same time we have a career session usually with um, students who have done each of the specializations so they will also be around to ask about the specializations as well if you're still struggling but there's it's usually end of october sort of by about mid November, we know where, which specialisations everyone's going to choose. Thank you. And um, are the specialisations capped in terms of numbers? Are you guaranteed your preferred specialisation? 
Um, there, there is a cap on it. Um, however, I think there has only been one year when we had a huge number of students. We had 60 students where people didn't get their first um, specialization. In all other years, everyone has got the specialization they have chosen to do. In the year where we did have to ask people, we, we looked very carefully at their backgrounds, their career aspirations, why they were choosing a particular specialization. And then they went to their second choice. But um, in, in every other year, everyone's got their first choice. Great. Um, and there's quite a specific question here. Um, will there be any modules that involve activities like community services that associate with any nutrition association? <laughs> OK, um, so I, th I think they're asking about um, the Association for Nutrition and, and whether there's anything that links with that. So there isn't specifically anything that links with that. We cover all the competences of the Association for Nutrition and that's how we're an accredited programme. But there's no activities that are separate to the programme that need to be done. Having said that, I, I wasn't sure when I looked at this question whether they were also asking about outside activities. So we do have links with some partnership organisations like Nutrition Scotland and North Lanarkshire Community Food and Health Partnership, where students have gone to do some activities, work with them for a little bit, um, but that's more in their own time and balanced alongside their studies. It, it's not as a necessity for the Association for Nutrition Accreditation. Perfect. Um, and we're always asked if we can, if you can tell us more about the project element of the programme. So how do students choose a topic, a supervisor, things like that? OK, so um, once you've chosen your specialisation in November, you will then have your specialisation teach in, in February through to March. Um, so you'll get to know your specialisation area. Your project has to be in your specialisation area. So assuming that you meet the requirements for going on to the project, um, you will need to choose what that project is. How we do that is generally we ask people to put forward academics to put forward projects so there are a number of academics within the program team and there are a number of external academics who also um, will research nutrition and have um, re research ideas um, so once we have a list and it is usually quite a, a large list i will go through and see which specializations fit those projects and then I will email out to say the clinical nutritionists or the clinical nutrition projects. And there, there's always way more than the number of students. And then the students make a choice from, from those. And, and by a decision-making process that involves myself and the specialization lead, we come up with who does which project. And generally they students get their first or second choice. Um, so and there is leeway to come up with your own project. The problem with doing that is you need to start very early thinking about it and talking to your specialization lead. Often people come up with projects that aren't feasible within the three month time frame. Um, so generally a, a lot of the students will choose off the list, but there's a whole wide range of projects within each specialization to encompass everyone's um, interests and career aspirations. The projects can be within a hospital setting, they can be data analysis, they can be literature reviews, they can be out in the community. So there's a wide range of settings um, depending on what you want to do the, in the laboratory as well. So we will try and give you um, information about every single project on the list, the, the, whoever is going to supervise the project will be a, available to answer questions if you have specific questions about a particular topic. So when you make your choices on from the, the project list, you will have hopefully got all the information you need and come up with the ones that really suit you and what you want to be doing in the future.
Thank you. And, and is there anything that students starting in September can do to prepare for the programme? Okay, so we have a, a range of students, as I said, um, some who have done nutrition and some who have done either a little bit of nutrition or no nutrition and have got a more um, general science background. So people who have done nutrition probably are fully aware of the nutrition background and maybe then just need to think about engaging with the the current literature and the current hot topics in the media um, so that they get a feel for what's going on and are coming to the program very engaged in what's happening in the nutrition arena at the moment. If students haven't got a nutrition background or if they feel that their background's um, not up to scratch or they did, it, did their nutrition degree a few years ago or something like that, then I would recommend that they go and um, look at the, there's a, some books that we recommend, which are the Nutrition Society books. And the first one of those is Introduction to Human Nutrition. And we can give students the link if they need that. Um, and that is available as an ebook once you're in, once you're in Glasgow. So it is possible to get it as an ebook. That, that sort of basic book will allow them to get up to scratch with nutrition so that they aren't struggling with their nutrition when they get in as well as the MSc transferable skills. What we find when people come to the program is that the first few weeks are so intensive. The first two courses are what we call flip teaching. That is we give a lot of material to students to read and to look at and then they come into the classroom and it's very much a discussion based session. And students often haven't had that way of teaching before, so find that quite hard at first. So the more nutrition background they can get, the better. And just to be cognizant of the nutrition that's the topics at the moment. So at the moment, you, they will have seen, or most people will have seen the debate about ultra processed foods, things like that. So it's just getting on top of oh, what's going on at the moment in the nutrition world. Great, and that actually leads on nicely to another question that we were asked is, do we need to buy many books for the programme? And if so, are they available a second hand from previous graduates? Okay, so, you know, if people are wanting to look at stuff before they come to Glasgow, then they may need to buy a book. And I would recommend the introduction to human nutrition, um, which is part of the Nutrition Society series. However, there's lots of introduction to human nutrition books. Um, once they get to Glasgow, anything that's recommended in terms of books is available as ebooks. And there's a couple of future learn courses that are free, and we also recommend those as well. So they shouldn't have to um, purchase anything hard as a hard copy, is what I mean. Um, as well as that, once they're in the programme, a lot of the literature is based around the primary literature. So it's looking at papers, scientific papers, rather than the book knowledge. We hope that people will come with the knowledge that you'd find in books generally as their background. And then when they're actually here, they'll be delving into the literature looking at evidence that supports arguments or disagrees with arguments so that they really get a feeling for being able to critically review what's out there in the evidence what what um, discussions are based on that sort of thing thank you and then we were asked a, a few questions about a uh, how students will be assessed throughout the program Okay, so there's a variety of assessments. Throughout the program, we're trying to meet competences of the Association for Nutrition for the accreditation process. So within every course, there is an element of reflection and reflecting on the competences and how the student has met the competences. So that happens through every course. Um, in some courses, they're solely assessed by coursework so food and nutrients and nutrition through the life cycle and dietary nutritional assessment and public health nutrition are solely assessed by um, 
coursework. The new research skills course will also be assessed by coursework. And there's an exam in digestion, absorption, nutrition, nutritional metabolism. And there's an exam in most, but not all of the specializations. So coursework can be anything. We've got some ongoing weekly quizzes, there's MCQs, there's essays, um, there's blog writing, uh, there are laboratory write-ups. So a whole range of different coursework depending um, which course it is. And then as I say, we've got two at the most exams. So one is the digestion absorption metabolism, which everyone will do, and that will be an a short essay and a data handling question within that exam. And the second one will be for three of the specialization, obesity and weight management, sports and exercise, nutrition and clinical nutrition, there'll be an exam in April. And those exams vary. Some, some are asking um, just data handling questions. Some have essay aspects as well. Some have other bits. Thank you. And there should actually be a wee bit more information on the different assessments for the various courses linked on our website um, under Programme Structure. So you should get a wee bit of information there as well. Um, we've got a couple of questions there in our chat box, so thanks for those. Uh, someone's asked, and asked how, um, do you have any top tips for ensuring success and meeting all requirements to complete the course? OK, my, my very top tip and it's, it's going to be challenging for a lot of students, is solely do the MSc. However, I realise that in the current situation, some people have to work, some people have care and responsibilities, so they can't just concentrate on the MSc. But that would be my top tip, to put the time in and to be able to, you know, immerse yourself in the MSc. I understand that's challenging in, in lots of cases. So in otherwise, I would say, you know, attend everything, even if you think that the slides are up on the virtual learning environment, make sure you attend everything, engage with everything. Um, and my other top tip is to ask if you're not sure. So as soon as you're thinking, oh, I'm struggling here, make sure you ask someone, don't leave it till the last minute because we can put in place a lot of support mechanisms um, to ensure that you, you get the right support, be that with academic work or whether it's something that's not non-academic that's causing you angst and you can't get on with, with your MSc. Annie, do you think there's any other things that I've missed there? No, I think you've covered it all. Um, definitely attendance is a big one attendance is the big one and it and I think next year we are going to have an attendance um, monitoring and that yeah. will again be for our accreditation so you know I understand that people have to have jobs or they may have care and responsibilities but to do those around the program commitments thank you and then there was another question there and it was can international students register with the EFN after graduation? Yeah. So the way the Association for Nutrition works is that we're an accredited programme. That means that if you pass the MSc, if you are awarded the MSc, plus you pass all the competences as we go along for the Association for Nutrition, um, you will be eligible to go for the direct entry for the Association for Nutrition. That allows you to become an associate registered nutritionist and international students do that as well as um, home and EU students so there's no problem there. What would a typical day look like for an MSc student in terms of What's expected in terms of how much time they're going to be in class versus what's expected of the night with class? Okay, it, it differs from week to week. So there are some courses that have a lot of things on during the week. By the time you get to specialisations, we can that 
you're only in two days for specialization. So Tuesday, Thursday are generally specialization days, but you will also in that period of time have some research skills work. So it won't just be that you're in two days a week. So it differs really early on, you're probably in four days a week, but it won't be four complete days. So you'll have breaks in between things. Um, we have sessions where we have to split the class up. So although three hours might be timetabled against journal club, you'll only be in for one hour of those because you're attending one of the sessions. Within, we're based at the new Lister building, which is off the main campus of Glasgow University. It's in the east end of the city, but within that campus where the teaching goes on, there is um, a social space and a computer cluster where students can work and, and work on their assessments out with their teaching. So if they're in for an hour and then have a gap of two hours before their next session, there's always places they can go within the new list of building to continue their work um, and to ensure that they keep on top of things. I would say that generally you wouldn't be in more than four days a week, but it's not always the case. If students are in the new Lister building, we try to make it that they're in the new Lister building all day. If, for, if we have anything that where it's on campus in the main site of Glasgow University, we'll make it that they're on campus all day. We don't have people traps in between different destinations because that makes it very hard for them to utilize their time sensibly in between things. Great, thank you. Um, and then what sort of jobs the graduates of the programme go on to do? Okay, so there's there's a range of jobs that graduates go on to do. Um, we, as I said earlier, we have a career session in October time where graduates from each specialisation come and talk to you and about their career trajectory and what they have gone on to do. So all, all students coming onto the programme will have that opportunity to chat to past alumni and see what they've done. Um, a lot of our students will go on to do PhDs. So we have you know, quite a substantial number who go on to do PhDs after the programme. Some will go on to do training in other arenas. So some use it as a stepping stone to dietetics or occasionally to other things like physiotherapy or um, other vocational courses like that. Um, we have a number of international students who are here for the year and then are going back to a job that they've already come from. So we have students who already know where they're going because it's, they've come over to do the programme and then they're going back to their work. Of the students who are here and uh, um, they can go on to do work afterwards, they go into the research arena, they go into consultancy. So we have people who work as nutrition consultants in gyms or a freelance consultants or lifestyle consultants. We have people in the research arena, be that in the food industry. So I've got a student who's just gone on to work in Mars. Um, we've had people working with Marlow Foods who produce corn. I don't know if they still do, but they did then. Um, so there are lots of jobs where people go into those sorts of industry type nutrition jobs. There are lots of people who go into research in either academic research, so in a university as well. There are people who will go on to do work with um, um, places like Zoe, Zoe Nutrition or Busy Bees Nutrition, who will also be offering nutrition advice to um, people who come to them. We have a lot of public health nutritionists, a couple of the, the people that I said where you, you could get um, some, some work during the year. So like Nutrition Scotland and North Lanarkshire Community Food and Health, they do development work in, in those sorts of careers. Um, I'm trying to think. So it's a range of like food, nutrition, food in, and industry type work, nutrition research type work in academia, um, going on to further education, uh, consultancy type work, and 
I think that sort of covers the main oh and health promotion that's the other thing that they may go on to do health promotion but we we have a you know a, a really good career service at Glasgow and it, during the careers day the careers um, one of the career service comes over and talks to students about careers and as I say the alumni come and they talk about what they've done in between. Thank you and then a couple more questions in our Q&A that we should hopefully have time for is one of them is do we have a clinical placement either as part of the general program or if we choose clinical nutrition specialism? No unfortunately we don't um, that isn't we we are a uh, looking at clinical nutrition in in the eyes of through the eyes of the the theory of it that's not to say we have a lot of clin clinicians come in and give the teaching but there's no practical placement within the program itself thank you and then another one we've got um can graduates from the msc pursue a job in dietetics in the future and is it possible to find jobs in hospitals right after their MSc? Okay, so it's not possible to do dietetics from, so we are uh, accredited by the Association of Nutrition. Our degree is nutrition. Um, dietetics, if you want to do dietetics and work in the UK as a dietitian, you have to have done uh, a programme that's accredited by the BDA, the British Dietetic Association. So there is a variety of programmes that will offer that um, accreditation, but it's not ours. Ours is different to dietetics. We have students who come on to the nutrition programme because they haven't got a nutrition background and also dietetics is heavily competitive. So they'll go on and do the dietetics from our programme. And we've had several students who have gone down that route and have become dietitians afterwards. We also when we had a lot more EU students, we had a lot of students who came who already had a dietetic background and then added the MSc nutrition background and then um, went to work back in their own countries as a dietitian. But as a rule, you can't just go straight to dietetics. Was there a second part of that question, Naomi? It was about working in hospitals after. Okay. Some, it is quite challenging to get work in hospitals, but it is possible. You can get work as a dietetic assistant in hospitals. Some people do clinical um, trials work within hospitals. Um, so there are NHS jobs that are available to um, our graduates. Thank you. And I think we've got time for maybe one last question. Um, so it's asking how does the graduation classification work for the masters? And it's got, for example, 80% plus for the highest classification, or is it 70%, 70 plus for second? Okay, um, it's quite hard to say because Glasgow, unlike all, all other universities, use a 22 point system. And from 18 to 22 is an A grade, and that's a distinction grade. From 15 to 17 is a B grade, and that's a merit grade. And from 12, to 14 is a C grade and that's a pass grade. So they're all out of 22. Everything is marked on that grading system. You're given A's, B's when you get your grades for any piece of coursework um, or any exam, you'll get it as uh, through that grading system. It's not as a percentage, but roughly that's where the grades lie. You have to get A grades. To, so A, B and C grades are master's level. C is the the past grade, B is the merit grade, and A is the distinction grade. Thank you. Um, there's a question in there that's asking about uh, conditional offers. Is that something that would be best to go to admissions or maybe to yourself, Annie, through the administration team box? I think probably to admissions okay. for Perfect. conditional offers, yeah. So there's an admissions link in that helpful links bit in the chat, so you could follow up through that. Um, that is us now at the end of our session. That was very fast and you covered a lot of information there. So thanks very much. Um, we hope we find that useful. If there's any questions we didn't get a chance to um, get to, um, please do use that um, administration inbox um, and we'll do our best to pick those up from there. And you can also find more information on the webpage uh, for the programme on our website. 
as I said, we have recorded the session, so that will be with you, um, so you can go over anything that you might have missed or want to hear again. So thanks very much to our panel for taking time out of your busy day, and we hope you find that useful, and we hope to see you all in September. So thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.